The train, for its type, is the most powerful vehicle on land. And the engines of Sodor are the power behind the docks, industries and branch lines that make up the world-renowned Northwestern Railway. These are the stories of Sodor. Hello engines, long time no see. How are you? Um, very confused Sir Topham. Don't misunderstand, I think I speak for all of us when I say it's a pleasure to see you again. We just didn't think it would be as your new controller? That's quite understandable. How is that possible sir? How can you be our controller and director of the railway board? I can't Toby, that's why I'll be stepping down as director. Due respect sir. Wouldn't that be a step backwards career-wise? I don't see it that way, but in light of recent events, I think it would be the best thing for all of us. All of us, sir? No need to be coy, Gordon. I'm aware that you're aware of my recent problems, just as I've been keeping abreast of your troubles. Pardon me, sir, but how exactly did you get our board of directors to pick you? Well, it's quite the story. Would you like to hear it? Oh yes, sir. Anything for a bit of variety on this island. Very funny, Gordon. Excuse me? Nothing, sir. Please continue. And this was the story he told. I know my constant mentioning of the war must be getting tiresome at this point, but it really is unavoidable. The railways had played a vital part in keeping the nation afloat and were a core component to its recovery. A major reason why they had proven so effective was largely thanks to the Fat Controller. Before the war, he implemented policies that streamlined procedures and bolstered efficiency across the network. And during the war, he visited countless yards and depots, providing stirring speeches to engines and staff alike. The papers titled him the Churchill of Trains, but unlike the Prime Minister, Sir Topham was able to keep his position when the fighting was done. Phew, the ashes were still falling over Hiroshima when Clement Attlee and his mob broke away from the wartime coalition government, which facilitated the need for an election. I don't pretend to know everything or anything about politics, but I was still astounded that Churchill wasn't re-elected. Attlee took power on the platform of social reforms and industrial nationalization, as I've mentioned before. Sir Topham was initially in favour of nationalising the railways and began seeing the wheels in motion to carry it out. But as time went on, he began having doubts about the whole idea. Unfortunately, he seemed to be the only one. Have you had the chance to review the proposal, Sir Topham? I have, Mr Hodges. And to be perfectly honest, I'm not happy with them. I have a number of issues I'd like to discuss. Of course, Sir Topham. Where do you want to begin? With these financial projections, they are completely unrealistic and unsustainable. My people have run the numbers, and we've estimated British Railway stands to lose up to £300,000 a day by 1962. That's assuming it survives till then. We can minimize those losses so long as we make the necessary cuts. You're talking about a sizable reduction in staff and services. That's bound to cause a lot of public discontent. Well, these are hard times, Sir Topham. I'm sure they'll understand the need for such economies. Do you think they'll understand the rampant bureaucracy of British Railways? I beg your pardon. I reviewed the proposed staffing figures for BR, and it seems to me that for every driver, fireman and station master getting the sack, two administrators are being employed. Surely you understand the need for effective and efficient administration? Yes, but if we cull the number of operational staff too much, there won't be anyone to administer. Hmm, you have a point, Sir Topham. Perhaps we should review that section. You mean leave it as is? 
Excuse me? Nothing. Tell me something, Mr. Hodges. When are these proposals going to be promulgated? Barring objections and revisions? Within three months, I'd say. Is there still time for other submissions? Well, yes. But who would... You've written your own proposals? I have, with the assistance of my staff and engines. Why would you consult the engines? Because any proposal concerning railways is bound to affect them, don't you think? Sir Topham, this is highly irregular. Oh, well, if you prefer the editor of the Times to hear them before you... Uh, no, 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 Sir Topham. I apologize for my wording. I meant to say, while irregular, we would still be delighted to hear them. Marvelous. Well, I'm proposing that rather than outright nationalizing the railways, the network shall be divided into small geographical regions. Each will become its own private company, responsible for maintaining the track, the stations, the staff, and so forth. But that's more or less the system we have now. Yes, but with some significant differences. While each of these companies will be privately owned and run, they will receive government subsidies provided they meet certain criteria. Reducing costs, following timetables, maintaining safety standards, and so forth. Under this scheme, the overall cost to the government will be minimal and eliminate the need for a massive central bureaucracy. And what about the engines and rolling stock? Just like now, they will be purchased by individual companies from workshops around the country. However, the manufacturing will be regulated by the state to ensure they are built to a uniform standard and design, reducing overall maintenance and running costs. So what do you think? Most original and imaginative, Sir Topham. We'll definitely take your proposals under advisement, and I'll be sure to have a word with the Minister. Splendid. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for your help, William. You've been a lifesaver. My pleasure, Albert. Glad to be of assistance. That's Mr. William's whole philosophy. Always willing and happy to help. Come on, Toad. You're embarrassing me. Not half as embarrassing as an emperor admitting to his subjects he's not a god. You talking about that Japanese bloke? What was his name? Hiro? Hirohito. I know that was months ago, but it still makes me chuckle. I think it's downright disgraceful for a man to pretend he's a god. Yes, quite. Just goes to show how daft folk are when subjected to the right amount of authority, charisma, and personality. Good morning, engines. Good, Good morning, morning, Sir Topham. Topham. How was your meeting at the Department of Transport yesterday? Well, I voiced my objections to their proposals, and they shot down each one. So about as expected. Indeed. They seem to take particular exception to my jab at the overmanning of the clerical and administrative side of British Railways. Looking back, I should have been more tactful in such a criticism. Due respect, Sir Topham, if you were tactful, you wouldn't be you. Very true, William. What did they say about your proposals, sir? You mean our proposals, Albert. They were certainly taken off guard. That Hodges chap then said it was highly irregular of me to present them the way I did. He quickly changed his tune after I insinuated the editor of the Times might end up reading them first. You didn't, sir. I did. Unfortunately, I don't think it'll do much good. Did they still reject them? More or less. Hodges called our proposals original and imaginative. Oh, dear. I don't follow, sir. Why is that a bad thing? Because, Toad, original and imaginative is the most damning phrase a bureaucrat can use. It's a polite way of saying, we don't like your idea, so stuff it. So, are you going to share our proposals with the Times, Sir Topham? Of course not. That would be highly improper. As long as I'm director of the railway board, we will not stoop to such underhanded behaviour. Sir Topham! Morning, Joe. What's the matter? A friend of mine just rang to give me a heads up about a story that'll be in today's papers. What sort of story? You're not going to like it. Indeed, the stout director was furious, as every newspaper in the country had the same story to share. The proposals for British Railways. 
Every key detail was leaked to the public, from the cutbacks to the staffing estimates. This caused profound public outrage as no community wanted to risk losing its livelihood. While the politicians pointed fingers, the police conducted an investigation. And unfortunately, their findings were just as damaging. It turned out the source of the leak was a member of the railway board, one who, like Sir Topham, strongly disagreed with the proposals. The director in question, who shall remain nameless, was not only sacked, he was also sent to jail for this unauthorized disclosure of a confidential document. I wish I could say that was the end of it, but it wasn't. There was another leak. This time, it was a section of the minutes taken during Sir Topham's meeting at the Department of Transport. Specifically, the section where he threatened to disclose his own proposals. Of course, this led to accusations the Fact Controller had authorized and even ordered the original leak to take place. Though he and the culprit vehemently denied this, it didn't seem to matter. The renewed outrage put Sir Topham on the defensive, overshadowing the backlash to the original leak. Around that time, he got a letter from Mr. Zorro's wife, asking him to come to Sodor to visit. He seized this opportunity to get out of London and away from the bad press. However, his trip to the island was not exactly straightforward. Ladies and gentlemen, we regret to inform you that due to technical difficulties, all trains bound for the island of Sodor will terminate at this station. For those passengers looking to travel to Sodor, bus services to the local marina are on offer with connecting ferry rides to the island. We apologize for the inconvenience and thank you for your cooperation. I'm sorry for this, Sir Topham. It's not your fault, Scott. Don't worry about it. What could the technical difficulties be? I imagine it's to do with the lift bridge to Sodor. It was last time. Last time? Yes, sir. The last time I ran the express to Sodor. Well, tried to. I only made it this far then, too. Your last express was only two weeks ago. Does it go down often? Yes, sir. Every time a train has to pass over. But in all seriousness, no. It used to run quite properly, until they started neglecting the maintenance. Is that because Mr. Corbett won't authorize the expenditure? Yes, sir. And you know, I know of Mr. Corbett's penny pinching, but I never thought it would extend to such important infrastructure. While on Sodor, I may have a few words with him. You mean, you're going on, sir? Of course. Why wouldn't I? I just thought you didn't like boats. I don't like boats. But I've come this far, so I may as well go the whole way. Very good, sir. Just remember, if you start to feel queasy, lock your gaze on a distant object and don't look away. Last time I did that, the object turned into a periscope. I'm sorry, sir? What did you say? Never mind. Thank you for the advice, Scott. I will see you on my return. Good luck, sir. You don't look all that happy, Stuart. Is something wrong? Indeed, Bertie. Our passenger numbers have been dwindling these past few months. I'm sorry to hear that. But from what I understand, railways don't make that much money off such a service. You're better off with freight contracts. Those have been drying up too, and I blame you lot on the roads. You what? What did I do? Yes, Stuart. What did he do? Sir... Sir Topham? I... I... Where did you come from? The lavatory. Are you alright, sir? Excuse my saying so, but you look as green as my paintwork. Yes, I'm fine. I had to take the ferry to get here, and... Let's just say I'm not much of a seafarer. Now tell me why it's Bertie's fault your workload has been decreasing. Because they had an unfair advantage courtesy of Mr. Freeman. That hasn't been proven. Oh, come off it. Who else would benefit from it? Hold up a moment. Are you talking about Giles Freeman? Yes, sir. You know him? I do. Please continue. There were a number of leaks and the standard gauge engines lost a lot of business to the roads. By extension, so did we. That's not my fault. I'm merely doing my job like you engines always have. Hmm. It seems like things have certainly changed on Sodor since my last visit. On that, sir, Stuart and I can agree. Can you both also agree to keep my presence a secret? 
Of course, sir. May I ask why? Instinct. Something tells me it's best I remain incognito for as long as I can. And not to boast, I have rather good instincts. Can I rely on you two? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Topham! Hello! Thank you for coming. Hello, Charlotte. So good to see you. Sorry I'm late. I had a hard time getting here. Oh? What happened? That doesn't matter. How's Nigel? He's doing very well. The doctors have even let him outside. Really? That's a good sign. He's out in the garden with Rachel. Rachel's here? I can't wait to see her. Come on, then. Nigel! Topham! How are you? I'm fine. I must say, you're looking well. And so are you, Rachel. Is that really you? It is. Rachel, you remember Grandpa's friend, Sir Topham Hatt? Yes. Hi, Toppy. Sir Topham, sweetie. Ho, ho, ho. It's all right, Nigel. My, my, you have certainly grown. How old are you now? Sixteen? Seventeen? I'm five. Five? I guess that means you'll be starting school soon. Yep. I can't wait for it. Grandpa said he's going to take me on my first day. Um, uh, Charlotte, why don't you take Rachel to that little cafe outside the hospital? I'd like to talk to Topham. All right. I hope you'll stop by for dinner tonight, Topham. There is no chance I'm going to miss your roast beef, Charlotte. Splendid. I will see you later then. Come on, darling. All right. Bye, Grandpa. Bye, sweetie. Thank you for being so upbeat in front of Rachel. No problem. Tell me honestly, how are you? I've been better, but the doctors say the operation went well. They think they got the tumor, and I start the chemotherapy trials next week. All we can do now is wait. But I have to say, waiting to find out who's going to replace me as controller has been more agonizing. Given the nature of the candidates, I don't blame you. How on earth did it come down to Corbett and Freeman? Bad luck. And whichever one gets it, the railway is going to suffer. Is there really no one else? There is. You. What? Are you joking? No, I'm being serious. I wanted to ask if you would consider taking over as controller of Sodor. Well, I mean, I, uh, I, it's just not possible, Nigel. Not so long as I'm director of the railway board. Then step down as director. <laughs> you don't ask a lot, do you? Topham, I know full well the problems you've been having. I don't believe for a second you are responsible for any of the recent leaks. And I think it's disgusting you're being blamed for it and that the Minister of Transport has asked you to retire. How do you know that? I was an intelligence officer, remember? Old habits die hard. There is no chance you're going to retire, so why not take a position that still allows you to serve amongst the railways? Sodor could definitely use a man of your caliber leading it. I suppose it's not completely outlandish. I do have a considerable fondness for this island. And there's that book series by the Reverend Audrey already naming me as Solos Controller. Yes, those books have caused quite a stir here. But I think their depiction of you is most apt. You belong here, Topham. There's still a snag. My credibility has been severely compromised because of the bad press recently. What are my chances of becoming Controller? Considerably better than Corbett's or Freeman's. How do you mean? You know those old habits I was talking about? Let's just say I indulged in them concerning the background of the current candidates. In what way? Sir Topham never actually told us what Mr. Zorro told him. The only thing he admitted was that he was rather alarmed by what he learned. In spite of this, he decided not to use blackmail to become controller of Sodor. Instead, he met in secret with the other members of the island's railway board. 
one by one, he persuaded them to support him for the position. To this day, I still wonder how he accomplished that without being found out. However he did it, on the day the board gathered to choose a new controller, the decision was a landslide. And that's all there is to it. Well, Sir Topham, you have our heartiest congratulations. What about Corbett and Freeman, sir? How did they take it? They too congratulated me, but I could tell they weren't happy. What's going to happen to them, sir? Are you going to sack them? No. Why not, sir? They may have their faults, but they also have experience and talents that could serve this railway. Needless to say, I will be having a very long conversation with each man once I'm settled. For now, if you'll excuse me, I'd best call my wife. She is bound to have a few words about my actions here. Whatever those words were, they were invariably supportive. Returning to London, he made the announcement that he was stepping down as director to become Sodor's controller. True to his word, after he moved to the island, he had a long talk with Corbett and Freeman. As a result of this, the purse strings were considerably loosened and the suspicious leaks benefiting the roads immediately stopped. All throughout that time, we engines were positively elated by the good fortune of having the Fat Controller take over. And as you will see in future stories, this optimism would not be misplaced. <laughs>